think you know fundamentally when we see the growth of the intelligent assistance market, um, it has to come in a natural. The, the interaction that the humans have with the computer has to be natural, um, and we, we you know talked about Siri and the evolution of, of Siri becoming more than just a, uh, a cliche kind of you know game that our kids play with our phone, but but really having more of a conversation and, and really bringing in that natural um, language understanding and the natural interaction. Uh, the panel here is going to talk about what makes a good virtual agent, um, and it's uh, in, ter in terms of design, in terms of emotion, uh, and, and in terms of the, the evolution of, of intelligent assistance. So um, I actually want to first have each, each panelist just kind of introduce themselves and your, your company and the, the roles uh, that, that you see uh, um, that you play there. So I can start with you, Mark. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, Mark Stephen Meadows, President of Botanic. And uh, been about 15 years now working on trying to make avatars talk. How do you get a little 3D character to engage uh, in systems that are flexible enough to be games, but also important enough to be healthcare? Um, and uh, we specialize really in that animation and essentially building the graphical user interface for natural language systems. And uh, so a little bit of time at Park. Mm, traveled around the world quite a bit. I'm a portrait artist and an author. Got tangled up in the wires, and I'm honored to be here with Lana and Steve. Good morning. I'm Lana Novikova. I'm new to the virtual assistant industry altogether, but I'm not new to consumer research and analytics. Uh, I spent 15 years in consumer packaged goods industry, digging deep into understanding people, consumers, shoppers why they do what they do, what their needs and motivations. And that brought me to uh, um, really being curious about psychology and neuroscience. For the last seven years, I've been digging into that understanding as deep as I can by <laughs> not having PhD in psychology and neuroscience. And here I am, uh, and six months ago, we launched an uh, artificial intelligence uh, company uh, called Heartbeat Technologies. So I'm a co-founder and CEO of that. It's, uh, we are from Toronto, Canada. And uh, the idea is to design algorithms uh, to analyze deep uh, and very finely refined uh, emotions of people based on text. So thank you for having me today. And uh, Steve Ardiri, um, Merchant Alight is my personal branding. I've been consulting uh, for software startups, early stage software startups. Current focus is machine intelligence, cognitive computing, conversational systems. I've been doing it about 20 years, and also very active in, in, in the cognitive uh, uh, end of things, like with IBM Watson, doing panels there. And I'll cite some references during this panel session. Great. Yeah, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I, I kind of want to start with, with, with building off what Steve was just talking about, about what makes a good virtual agent. You know, we, we talk about using automated resources, um, having that natural interaction. Um, how, and how is the current state of that interaction? Um, and, and how do we move beyond uh, kind of natural, or move beyond a, a Q&A kind of you know, response and, and return to more of a, of a, you know, a better conversation? So what, what does make a, a, a good um, virtual agent? Start with you, Mark, and then. Well, I think ultimately we're building software robots. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to figure out how to build robots that are not robotic, for one. In order to make them humane, in order to make them something that we can trust, we have to have some sense of identity and, and interaction with them that's basically human. So from the critical standpoint, we need to stop thinking so systematically mm -hmm. and making robotic robots. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think secondly, we need to figure out how to have systems that we're not, especially with assistants, I'm having to constantly check the work of my assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, I was need a, whether it's dictation or whether it's location, I don't actually trust my assistant, and so I'm having to always kind of second guess it. So I think we not only have a more humane improvement to do in terms of the design, mostly, more so than functionality, but we also need to make sure that the work is of higher quality. Thank you. Um, yeah. My short answer would be uh, empathy and emotional intelligence. Mm. And uh, a previous speaker, Steve, talked, uh, said that agents has to understand the systems. I would add that uh, now it's time to understand the system, which is human being, and it's a very, very complicated system. So just to quote, that brain ha our brain has 86 billion neurons with tens of thousands of connections. 
And uh, it's an interesting metaphor. It helps me understand what the brain is and who we actually are building our robots to. Uh, your brain is not this well-organized hierarchical control system where everything is in order, in order and very dramatic, a very dramatic vision of bureaucracy. In fact, it's more like anarchy with some elements of democracy. <laughs> so think about New York City. Uh, many very tight neighborhoods all connected, interconnected in such a complexity that no one can understand how it works. Uh, from one point of view, it looks like chaos. From another, it's like uh, uh, anarchy with some elements of democracy. So we, uh, I would uh, inspire, want to, uh, you know, Heartbeat uh, and uh, my team want to inspire this uh, experts, the technology experts, to go deeper into understanding the system of human mind and human psyche. And that will lead us to understand the individual, their rational, their emotional life, their motivations, their needs, their fears. And the more we understand our user, the more we build better machines for them. Hmm. So uh, and uh, another metaphor is at Heartbeat, we want to put uh, a heart in the Tin Man of technology. So imagine like he's marching there looking for a heart. And uh, by understanding intricate uh, emotions and motivations, that's what we, I think we, we, we driving towards that, to putting heart into that heart, into Tin Man. And I'll chime in here. So. Um, in addition to the very nice depiction of the map you just put up with VP yeah. profiles, the intelligent assistants, they're uh, one of the most heavily retweeted, if you haven't seen it, and I'll just point you to the website since we're not running slides, is uh, the machine intelligence uh, landscape. This is done by uh, Siobhan Zillis. Uh, eight, uh, um, you can look it up. It's SiobhanZillis.com with a Z. Um, so what she has really across the top, and this has been pointing to, is that there's a lot of core technologies needed. You know, I like the, I like the uh, definition of machine intelligence because uh, MI equals AI plus machine learning. And uh, uh, up at top, she has all the categories for machine learning, deep learning, NLP, speech. And that has to, be support, that has to have uh, integrated uh, supporting technologies. This, is, this gets into a lot of the, you know, what you're creating are really a bunch of knowledge graphs with interest graphs, with intent graphs. All of those have to be interleaved together. It's quite a challenge integrating this. And what the goal, you know, that, that I think um, we're looking to, uh, to address here is the notion of it's more than just, you know, creating a semantic graph. What's really missing out there today, and there's a lot of startups, well-funded startups, in addition to the big players, is doing episodic memory. So you can't do transitive reasoning unless, uh, without episodic memory. And episodic memory is your memory of, of, uh, of events, people, what, what, what occurred in the past at a particular time and place. And once you have that established, this gives you the ability to recognize relationships with inferential reasoning and then we're on the way to actually creating these, these more common sense reasoning uh, virtual person assistants. So that, that's, well, go ahead. Uh, I have a go. quick anecdote to just support that. I was talking to my 10 year old daughter the other day and she's a heavy user of Siri. She talks to Siri like it's your friend. And I said, Dasha, what would you want Siri to have? I'm going to talk to this people who are, you know, people who design uh, apps like Siri. She said, mom, tell them to uh, make Siri remember what I told her yesterday. Yeah. It's frustrating because <laughs> she keeps Siri remembers. Uh, uh, I mean, for now, a age mm -hmm. and the name and very basic fact, right. but she totally forgets what Dasha asked her yesterday. In the <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the episodic memory. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, and so that's it. Kind of gets back to a little bit of what Steve talked about in terms of the data that that an intelligent assistant or assistant can understand. In terms of you know, so you add location, you add you know more more data, more context. Um, episodic or not, like, you know, the, is, is that the issue? Is it more data input or, or is it more the, the design in terms of how you're able to interact with that intelligent assistant? <clears throat> well, it's actually both and, and, and they're fused together is you, you need to be able to establish, you know, a bench, you know for, for example, you know, Google Knowledge Graph is really a huge entity graph, people, places, things. Mm -hmm. So there is some work, I mean, MIT just cited, you know, their, their work with uh, ConceptNet uh, 5, which has the ability of a four-year-old. So they're starting to teach, mm -hmm. you need to interleave concepts and relationships with people, places, things, events. And that springboards to be able to design what we've been talking about, you know, right. more of uh, allowing you to tease in memory 
episodic memory and then do some, the reasoning is really the toughest thing out there to do. Right, how, how far away are we from that? Well, there are, there are, I mean, if you really look at reasoning engines, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's psych. Uh, people familiar with psych, cyc.com. It's, uh, this is Doug Lanat's company. It's been around for about 30 years. And this goes, be, you know, so they actually design all the predicate logic in terms of, you know, the, uh, the concepts and relationships. And this is getting us closer. It's probably the closest current instantiation of, of common sense reasoning. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of work going on right now sure. from all the obvious targets and some well-funded well startups as well. Right. Yeah, that's, that's also, I guess I understand what I'm like 30, 40 years of work they've got behind that thing, you know? And th there's a real question, though, that I want to put down, just to clarify this dialogue a bit, because it's like, okay, when will we be, when will we be there? Or what is the intelligence of a four-year-old? And I think that we really have to also ask ourselves, what is intelligence? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, Dawkins has in his book on intelligence a definition, which is its ability to predict the future, but I think at the same time, I certainly don't know what intelligence is. There's many different kinds, like emotions, many different kinds of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I think that the intelligence of a four-year-old, well, that four-year-old is eventually going to be a 40-year-old. <laughs> Are they going to be get, do they get smarter as they get older? So there's experience built into common sense as well. And I think that a lot of us are just glossing over these assumptions of what is common sense, what is intelligence, and what is interaction. I think we have to get very specific about the use case and the end user and then design from their back. So there, I think psych is an amazing system for sure. And I, and I ask that we be specific in our definitions of these things, sure. please, Mr. Top. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's the point of this. I think we're trying to coin terms like intelligence assistance or phrases and, and define what those mean. And I think that's, that's evolving. There's, there's, you know, talking about this um, additionally, like the idea of artificial intelligence meant something five years ago versus 10 years ago versus, you know, 100 years ago. So, so the idea of um, what, what you're talking about is, is it's, a, it's a dynamic, ever, changing type of uh, uh, environment. Um, I, I want to talk a little more about the, the design issue because that's obviously something you're focused on, Mark. And, um, and, you know, the intelligent assistance that we had, the awards yesterday was, we, we did look at personality, we did look at, you know, kind of like how you're able to interact, what are, what are some of the, you know, the character, um, you know, developments when it comes to talking to or, or interacting with, a, with, a, with an intelligent assistance. Um, I think we talked about, you know, a little bit of that, that the technology is already there. The data inputs are still coming there. The context, all of the other kind of episodic reasoning, all of that needs to be there. But, but it, is it a technology issue or is it a design issue in terms of how, how we currently are, are working with, with intelligent assistance? Well, I, I think it's absolutely a design issue at this point. <laughs> I mean, we, we can do perfectly good natural language understanding, voice recognition. We can do text-to-speech. We can do avatar animation. Yes, things will improve. Let's look at movies as they were 40 or 50 years ago. Let's look at the beginning of the cinema, for example. Because ultimately, I believe what we're dealing with is either a cinematic art or a literary art or an intersection of the two. I'm not sure which. But the animated avatars that we make, we use camera moving and, and a lot of these cinematic techniques. The very first cinema example was a train that rushed towards the audience and everyone freaked out and got out of their seats because they thought the train was going to come out of the screen. <laughs> Did that movie work? Yes. It wasn't a question of the technology. We continue to improve the technology in cinema for sure, and we'll continue to improve our technologies for virtual agents and intelligent agents, mm -hmm. assistants, whatever the hell these software robots are called. So from my standpoint, we have the technology that's operable. What we need to do is look at the end user's needs and understand how to build the system so that it's appropriately designed for them, not to solve every problem in the world. I mean, you can't have you know, so many chatbots, for example, suck because you try to ask them, uh, and it, it can't talk about anything with anyone at any time. Even a human can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so because we don't have specified use cases, we don't have specified designs. And because we don't have specified, specified designs, we have crappy products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think... Well, uh, well, and, and that leads to uh, understanding of the end user. And just right. like with as many different technologies, there's many different segments of end users. There could be a boomer uh, who is a late adopter of technology and not quite comfortable. So very, very basic information, making them comfortable with your assistant yeah. uh, would be probably the end goal. And someone like Dasha, who is na native with uh, artificial intelligence right. assistance, and uh, by the age she's 18, she'll have money and she'll be using it every day and how yeah. she's gonna use it, it's just sky's the limit and everything in between and the world is growing I mean now what's we have five billion people connected to the internet and it's only growing just think how, how many of those 
different types of end users we are. And that technology is like one type of technology can appeal to one group and it totally you would lose the other group altogether. Mm. So I think the beauty of that chaos is that there'll be a perfect match for a perfect target. Right. Ultimately. Well, How are we gonna get there? We all are working on <laughs> Well, that, that's right? another question that comes yeah. up like you'll have, you know, one personal assistant or uh, you know, or intelligent assistants are a million, like in terms of, and how do those intelligent assistants, assistants interact with each other, interact with you, and um, that's, that's an open-ended question. Yeah, uh, and, pick, and picking up on that, I agree design and picking up on, on what you just stated, Lana, is that you know, AI is only fully useful when it knows you in multiple contexts. It has right. to learn your habits, your routine, your behavior. So there's a lot of facets, you know, to the diamond there. And, um, and if you look at, you know, even, you know, uh, you know the, the luminaries out there, like uh, Jan LeCun at Facebook and Andrew Nigg, I just, I just happen to have a couple of pointers. There's, a, there's uh, um, you, know, you know, they're saying we have a long way to go, is what they're talking about. And that's, that's problematic, is that most of the, of the machine learning today is, is mostly supervised learning, where you have to train your models. And, but the real action right now is, is going to unsupervised learning and getting into genomic, uh, 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 more sophisticated algorithms. But there's, uh, there's also addressing the whole notion of, uh, of some misconceptions, which are, which are quite interesting. And I'm just talking about a recent interview with Lacoon. AI won't have emotions. They most likely will, to support what we've been talking about here. And the whole thing is that these are triggers, you know, low-level instinct or anticipating, you know, what you know, what human emotions. And it isn't ma it's a matter. It's not a matter of supplanting. It's in conjunction with. So this is all, you know, similar to the whole notion of is uh, in, in intelligence amplification rather than, you know, maybe maybe a better descriptor of it. And emotions will play a big role because of what we've been talking about here. Just, just to add something to this, I think you know, what you two are making me realize is that personality is probably the user experience of intelligent assistants. Uh, that if we have a personality, we know how to interact with someone. And I think that the quantity of the intelligence or the knowledge base or the topics that we have or whether it's the APIs that our cloud aggregator is binding to, all of that stuff is contextualized and interfaced by the personality of the assistant we're speaking with. I don't know what kind of a person Siri is, so I don't know whether I should ask how tall <laughs> the Eiffel Tower is or whether I should have her to book me a table you know, down the street. Right. So I think that those elements of emotion and the elements of intelligence and knowledge are bound together by personality. And that right. interface then helps us build a product that is actually an assistant instead of just access to data. Right. Right, well, and th there's a continuum. We talked about an, an assistant to an advisor to a companion, you know, a la her or something like that, which, you know, of course, is in the near future. But w when you do bring in personalities or emotion, and, and I do want to learn more about the technologies that are able to, to you know, br bring out emotion when it comes to intelligent systems, what other use cases does that, um, you know, uh, uh, what uh, opportunity does that come up for the other use cases? We talk about customer care here, obviously, a lot, customer service, and, um, you know, and, we, and within the verticals, we talk about finance and um, automotive or healthcare. Uh, what are, when we do have more personality, more emotion, more true context and companionship, what, what are some of the, you know, um, uh, use cases that are, that are new for that? Just open it up to the, the panel. My, uh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, my, my big ambitious dream would be to design apps for very particular use cases. For example, um, well, I have some background in psychotherapy. I had two years of uh, practice. I understand how important it is to have that personal uh, shrink in the pocket, let's call it that, or some, <laughs> something available 24-7 uh, for you to speak into and express your emotions, say, you know, a panic attack, a teenager before exam is uh, having, and you can speak and that machine would understand emotions and just take a guided meditation and meditate, you know, take you through a few breaths where you would calm down and feel great. 
in something like that. Um, I volunteered at hospice, so end of life care. It's a huge need for personal assistance, for the family, for the people uh, dying, and for everybody, for the older network. You know, the more help can be given there, the better, because humans can handle that uh, pressure. And yeah. so the medical, I mean, the hospitals. So it's huge use cases. And again, it could be little uh, use by use apps. They don't have to be super sophisticated, talking and walking and mimicking your, could be just that conversation in the right time and the right moment, programmed to make you feel better, to make you breathe better, to make you drive safer. If you're in a driving, uh, you know, uh, panic attack, for example, you know, someone who can just detect it hmm. and help you calm your system down, calm your parasympathetic system down. And again, it's, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. Right, but it's so health science. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you a couple, and it's, again, pointers. That's why there were two inclusions in that Siobhan uh, Zillis about rethinking enterprise, rethinking industries. We heard uh, from uh, Geraldine yesterday on, you know, uh, kind of flipping, you know, CRM on its head with uh, manage, I think it was manage customer relationships is the acronym. But uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a really great use case for the enterprise and then for, you know, for the consumer. So regarding rethinking enterprise, since I spent a lot of time in, in you know, in that space, uh, I think, I think that one of the biggest ones are systems of intelligence will be replacing systems of a record. So it's going to be able to combine historical context with real-time data. And, uh, and then these systems will, you know, constantly learn and predict and, inf and influence the de decisions. And, uh, and uh, uh, actually, I picked this up. I don't have the source of it. But alluding to Peter Drucker's thinking, effectiveness should be a human pursuit, why efficiency uh, should be delegated to machines. Uh, the one in the customer uh, in the customer space, which I'm really keen on, and it's already happening right now, is how AI will revolu re revolutionize the marketing industry. And uh, and um, Saatchi, for example, just uh, a few a couple months ago, deployed a intelligent advertising billboard at a bus station in London that judges a viewer's emotion. So it has a NLU engine for generating phrases that are constantly changing. It creates ads and images. That, that are based on viewer response, and then they're thinking about adding live interaction or facial recognition. Coke just deployed a similar thing in a, a subway station. So really, uh, there's a lot of implications for, you know, for revolutionizing marketing and AI. The beauty of this is now it's out in the physical world with ambient intelligence, and the road doesn't have to go through Google or Facebook. So that's what I like. Yeah. You know, um, I think that the, the use cases for effective computing, if I can try to summarize it like that, mm -hmm. um, I, I think are, are massive. And if I look at traditional psychologists such as Freud or Jung, or even folks that have looked at, um, you know, some of the more counterparty groups like uh, Joseph Damasio, they say that most of our, our, our decisions are actually emotionally oriented. That first we have an emotion, which is this kind of ability to make a huge set of decisions very quickly. And then we get down into like picking over the nits and we use some other cognitive capacity that's much more logically based to then like pull apart the details. But ultimately we're emotional creatures. And so I think we have to make emotional machines. I think this Saatchi and Sa the, the, the MC Saatchi example is an excellent one because those advertisers understand that our decisions to purchase and move and talk are emotional. A lot of our work is based on effective computing. And please, if you don't know what effective computing is, please go Wikipedia this, because I think it's really the, the forefront of AI. And we try to collect camera data, lexical data, and data from the microphone, and then build sentiment models of the user where we can find redundancy between those three different sets of data. Because you don't always have a confidence ranking above, say, 60% for any one of them. But when you stack them together, and you've got three people that are all 60% confident about the same thing, well, it's probably a pretty good decision. In any case, the avatar also has to move in a way that presents the affect or the emotion of the system. Because we're used to having that emotional, affective, interactive loop amongst ourselves. So from my standpoint, there is almost any time we're interacting with one of our virtual assistants, it's a use case for effective computing. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to look at how effective computing is coupled into knowledge base, natural language, and graphical user interfaces. So I think it's the core, it's the foundation of what we're building here. Right, right. 
And, and it's okay. just a matter of a few years before most of us will wear some form of wearable device. And what uh, uh, Mark just said, uh, think biometrics will be added to that and would be seamless. Maybe even the uh, brainwave technologies will crack the, uh, you know, the effect in the brain, which is the cleanest way, apart from MRI, to see the positive, negative, uh, high and low effect. So adding to all that, just think of opportunities that could be there. Right. Uh, just to, and I know, right, Richard, we need to move on quickly. It's, and I want to open up the audience too. If there's any any questions, please please feel free to put up your hand, and Dan will get it. Um, just to, to talk about the kind of the. the the personalization and the marketing and the kind of one-to-one, -one, you know, where you're getting that segmentation, what, what are the challenges that does that present uh, in terms of, you know, either privacy or, you know, making sure that w as we transition to that level of, of interaction, you know, that, that, that like visceral interaction with an intelligent agent, an intelligent assistant, what, what, are, what are some of the, you know, just things, best practices we need to think about when it comes to, to, to um, you know, either information, privacy, you know, the uncanny, really, like, uh, you know, um, interaction, just? Well, I think, you know, you just, I think it really boils down to, depending on what uh, side of the fence you are, is that you just need to be circumspect in terms of what you want to reveal about yourself, because yeah. what you reveal is going to be captured in some way, shape, or form. And I just had one other comment regarding, you know, to really peg the whole notion on the, the, uh, the uh, violent agreement regarding emotion is that people, people don't change behavior on information, they change it on emotion. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly add that, uh, you know, like um, imagine yourself coming into a party and how you uh, enter naturally, seamlessly, the conversation of other people will define how they take you. So if you're awkward and you come with your agenda, here I am, an avatar, <laughs> uh, you probably won't be taken naturally. Right. So I'd say that the, uh, apart from privacy and respect and trust, um, social intelligence is very important, how you come in, and people need to give you permission to be, uh, do, 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 you, do they want you to be their friend avatar, or they want you to be just a platform to enable their interaction, just a Facebook or Airbnb or Uber, yeah. which technology found amazing case, uh, cases for enabling that interaction. People now want to talk to people, they want to connect with people across the world. It's a huge trend. And um, if you, I just came across an amazing report, and I won't go through all of that. It's called Five Human Insp Insp uh, Inspirations. So if you give me your cards at the end uh, of the conversation, I'll send you that report. It's a huge segmentation study by agency here in New York. And I would like to keep going, that con con keep that conversation going. Yeah, yeah, thanks, the, this, this privacy issue is really, I think, at the very heart. We, we keep looking at it, and I think the reason is in almost every single panel, because our private data is our identity. And without our identity, we can't perform in the world. And if we lose our private data, then we lose our ability to perform. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we need to give our private data to these agents to be able to perform on our behalf. There's a, there are multiple industries within this notion in terms of things like the blockchain, where we can preserve our identity cryptographically and securely, but still have it accessed. In terms of the Onion, the Tor network, encryption protocols, where we can put different layers of encryption within packets that are being sent. There are tons of technical abilities that we have. But what I think we need to understand is that these things are like drugs, that these agents are a lot like drugs. And I tell everybody, Make sure you know what the benefits are, make sure you know what the side effects are, make sure you know what the addictive capabilities are, and use it with caution, and salt your data, salt your identity. I'm a 68-year-old woman on Facebook. None of my friends are confused by that, but the machine sends me a lot of liposuction <laughs> advertisements. That's fine. I know then who's a machine and who's a human. So salt your personal identity. You can use encryption protocols in other ways. And just really briefly, I would like to also point out that I think we have an incredible future in front of us by having machines like a guardian avatar do a lot of our bidding on our behalf, in which they are actually something that works as an anonymous membrane for us to filter information and to talk with other agents. That's a whole other conversation, but I think that we are beginning to look at these software robots in new ways so that our identities can be protected and yes, we all have things to hide. That's why we wear pants, right? <laughs> so we need to figure out what's appropriate to hide and what's appropriate to show. And these agents can serve as a perfectly great kind of an extension, like a jacket or a pair of pants, if you will. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one question. Did, 
back there. Uh, the, yeah, get the mic on. There it's we on. go. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on something that Steve said. You know, in this industry, we're building tools. I hope we all agree that we're building tools for people to use. Steve, when we talk about Saatchi with a billboard that reacts to me, I gotta say, A, it's an invasion of my privacy, and B, it's a tool using me to advertise. It's nothing, it, it, it's, it's totally reversed from where I would expect tools to, to be used. So I'm, I'm curious to see what your, what your take is on that. How do you feel about, about the Saatchi billboard? Um, you know, it's all, just like it's opt-in on the, on the, on the web, mm -hmm. um, it's opt-in if you want to engage with it. And if you actually look, you know, at, at, I, I looked at the Coke video, is that, um, you know, people look at it and if, they're, if it doesn't, if they don't have the muse as far as, you know, regarding that. So it's really, it's non-intrusive. Actually, Facebook and, and others are much more intrusive and no one can do anything about it. So I, you know, I look at it as something on, it's, it's literally defined by the user, whether they want to engage, whether it be, you know, out in the ambient physical world or over, over the internet. Yeah, I'd like to ask also, whose tool is it? Uh, I don't think, it, I mean, the, the assumption is that it's always the end user's best interest. But that's certainly not the case with Google or Facebook. Those are essentially advertising industries. You are Google's product, right? So Google's a great tool for advertisers, and, and well, it happens to also be a good tool for the end user. And that's why I think when you really consider whose tool is this, what was that actually designed for? We are oftentimes duped by intelligent agents, by the people that are actually running the real intelligence, the natural intelligence, as the engineers and the designers of the system. So I think the presumption that the tool is for the end user is one that should be uh, hard to be questioned. Right. Great. Well, good thought-provoking topics there. So I want to thank the panel. Well, thank you.